ahead, traffic ahead, reduce speed, reduce speed. You know, honey, I just love my new Hackett GPS. She's always so reliable and so accurate. Always gets me where I want to go on time. That's nice, dear. Traffic ahead, traffic ahead, reduce speed, reduce speed. We're not going to get there in time. My gosh, what are we going to do? I travel clear across country to come to this wonderful cafe to have a margarita. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. I mean, and you know how I love my margaritas. Trying to get you and, and, uh, and, this, and this machine is telling us, uh, Traffic you know, ahead. our inner creativity, we have to spend a little time every day connecting, I like to think of it as courting the beloved, with your spiritual practice, because, because there's so many wonderful, delicious distractions on this earth plane, that if we don't begin our day remembering who we are, it's very easy to keep going in doing habitual things, traveling the, the route that we've done over and over and over again and scared to get off when you know there's like something, get off of the exit right here. <laughs> I don't know about y'all's little voice. Sometimes it starts like really silent, but mine gets loud. Peter's doesn't get loud, but mine gets loud because I seem to understand loud. But I want to talk about this, spending some time. The, the book that I'm using this month and that we're using our companion book is Creative Mind and Success. And it's a wonderful book by Ernest Holmes. It's my favorite. He says, the individual who has the most power is the one who has the greatest realization of the divine presence. 
and to whom this means the most as an active principle of his life. The individual who has the most power is the one who has the greatest realization of the divine presence, and to whom this means the most as an active principle of his life. Well, I can't have a realization of the divine presence if I don't court the divine presence, if I don't recognize the divine presence as you, as the trees, as my home, as my family, as my job, as my spiritual community, as the bumps, if you will, and the terrain of life. And so how do I know? In this philosophy, we begin at the beginning with the premise that there's one life, that that life is God's life, that that life is perfect, that that life is my life, that that life is your life, that that life is the life of all. Well, we can say that all day long, but if we don't actually spend time in contemplation, if we don't actually spend time mining that truth until it becomes our own, not just some words out here, I can't experience that. And why it's important to begin there is because the nature of that life is creative. It is always creating. We refer to that life as infinite intelligence, right? That's one of the ways we refer to it. Well, it's infinitely expressing. It's infinitely evolving. It's infinitely expanding. We are creative not because we have to do anything, not because of artistic endeavors, simply because we exist. We are a creation of the infinite, creating our individual lives, our individual worlds, and how we experience them. And so if I don't know that about myself, then I'm kind of just living, I'd like to say by default. And it might not even be my default. It might be my parents' default, which might have been their parents' default. And my mama's parents were born in the Depression. I definitely don't want to be creating that in my life, right? Scarcity and lack. And I'm not saying that was all that my grandparents experienced, but I'm saying if I don't know who I am, then I'm not actually consciously co-creating in my experience. I'm not creating from a place of awareness, from a place of awakeness, from a place of aliveness. I'm not creating from the place that I am a powerful expression of divine presence. So what else does that mean? Ernest Holmes says there's a power for good and we can use it. So that means, for me, that that power is always conspiring for my good so I can create whatever I want to create. Even if I'm having an unpleasant experience, if you will, I can choose how I move through that experience and then what that experience becomes. I tend to think of those unpleasant experiences as fertilizer or mulch for the garden of my life. But I want to go back to, to this nature, to this, to, this, um, and to this thing about the nature of life is created. I am an expression of life, so it is my very nature to create. And so there's something important about me cultivating that time with the infinite. Also, what do I want to create? Do I want to create from my past, from stories I may have picked up from family or the society in which I live that might kind of box me in? Do I want to create the GPS story? Like, what's my GPS? Is it just is it some guidance system that I picked up at? Um, oh, I can see the store, but I can't think of the name. That's fine. There we go. <laughs> do I want to pick up that, or do I want to, or do I want my GPS as, as we like to call it here, our God, our divinity system, right? Our divinity system, the system of life, the system of freedom, the system of joy, the system of peace, the system of abundance, the system of there's plenty of good, and we can all have some. Is that the guiding system that I want to be giving me directions in my life? I don't know about you guys, but I'm sure you do. Because you're someone. Thank you. Yes. That's the GPS we want to be following, right? That's what we want to plug our coordinates into and then to tell us to turn right and turn left. So I want you to take a second. I'm going to assume, I'm going to ask you to, right here and right now, for this month, to work with my definition. That there's one life, that life is God's life, that life is perfect, that life is your life. And that your very nature is creative. So I want you to think of some good that you want to create in your life, whether it's more peace, a loving relationship, fulfilling work, having a, a great communication, whatever that is. I want you to think of that, and I want you to tell your neighbor next to you what that thing is. And if you don't have a neighbor next to you, find somebody and tell them the good that you want to create. Just one thing.
Thank you for doing that with me. So here's the importance of what you want to create, right? If I don't choose, then I'm, I'm just experiencing from default. If I don't choose my next good, then I, how can I ever experience it if I'm unwilling to choose it? I like to say, uh, students that take my class, they giggle at me for this, but like, let's say you wanted to go on a vacation. And you go up to, the, the, you're at the airport, and you say, I'll take a ticket, please. <laughs> well, well, what's the young lady going to say? She's just like, okay. Sir, could you please step to the side so I can help the next question? You gotta know where you wanna go, right? You also need to know when you wanna travel, right? So you need to know what you want. Then once you know what you want, then the next thing you have to do is, at least I believe anyway, we have to do a little bit of research. And the research is, so you just told this person what you want. Was there any little residual like, well, I don't really know, I don't know about time for that. Oh God, can I really add one more thing to my schedule? I don't know if I have the money for that. I don't really know how to do that. I'm not actually really sure I can have that, right? All of those voices kind of rush into us. And sometimes we don't, we don't actually get to create the good we want because we listen to those voices instead of notice the voices and then decide, wait, do I really want this? Okay, then how do I go about experiencing this? So first I want to hear a little chatter and then I want to tell that chatter, thank you and be quiet. Somebody else is doing this good that I want to experience, so there's absolutely there's no reason that I can't have that experience for myself, right? Then the next thing you want to research is see who's doing it already. I love Google. I'm sorry. I love. I'm not sorry. I love Google. <laughs> Judas, you can look up anything, and there's some information about it. So, so you can do some research. Okay, who's done this before me? Who's gone before me? Maybe Spirit has given you a completely unique idea, but there's something that already exists on this plane that perhaps you might pattern yourself after. Or perhaps you know people in your life, in your community, or there's an organization in your community, but you've got to do a little research on, so how do I get from this idea into action and experience, Right? So in that, in, that, in that movement, you also, we also have to be willing to let go of what is, to let go of those stories. You can pick them up later if you want, after you create the good. I would invite not to, but you know, <laughs> do what you want, right? But, for, but to create this good, we want to be willing to let go of any chatter that doesn't serve this good that we want. And we want to research it. And what happens when we begin to research what we want to do, when we begin to move in the direction of that, right? How many times are you surprised you wind up having a random conversation or you're in the grocery store and the person behind you is talking about the thing that you want? Or you're on Facebook and somebody said, and you're like, oh my God, I wanted to know that. And there's the information. But the universe can't respond to me with what I want if I don't first know what that is. Ernest Holmes goes on to say in Creative Mind and Success this. We are making our environments by the creative power of thought. By conforming our lives and a thought to a greater understanding of life, we shall be able to bring into our experience just what we wish. Letting go of all that we do not want to experience in taking in what we desire. We, you guys, we are making our environments by the power of our creative thought. So if I just let the old dialogue, I don't know, I'm not as good as, well, you know, Robin's a better singer than me. Well, Veronica's like such a poet. What am I creating? Yeah, I'm creating fear. I'm, crea I'm creating limitation, right? That's right. I I'm, I'm creating for Robin and Veronica's fabulosity. But what am I doing for my own, right? Sometimes that happens when we want to create good. We have a tendency to compare. So there's something that our former music director used to say, and many of you know it, some of you don't, so I'm going to say it again because I think it bears saying. Comparison is the death of joy. Every time I compare, see, in the, in the Science of Mind textbook this morning, I didn't know it was there because otherwise I would have quoted it for you guys. It talks about the nature of spirit being creative and us being creative beings. Well, if I'm always staring at how good Veronica's poetry is and how great Robin's singing is, I'm actually continuing to co-create my limited singing. I'm stifling my own voice. Whatever your thing is that you want to do, we think it's like a no thing, right? We're just stating the obvious. Well, well, that's theirs. But that doesn't mean that there's not room for my voice. That doesn't mean that there's not room for me to write. But if I don't believe in me, 
If I don't stand up for my good, how can I experience that? So what kind of environment am I creating? And what kind of environment am I trying to create in? When we allow that negative self-talk to go unchecked, it's like trying to create something new and sludge or quicksand. And then we make up a story, well, the universe must not want me to have this. Um, I'm just going to tell you right now, that is just complete nonsense. That's not true. The nature of life wants for us what we want for ourselves. Its very nature is expression. Its very nature is creativity. So when we're not creating, we're stagnant. And life is its gift to us. What we do with it is our gift back. Your creativity, that desire, that urge you have, life wants to experience itself in, as, and through you as that. And that's not the end all, be it all. The other thing we do sometimes when we think about creativity, and I know y'all don't do that because you're way too smart, but just in case somebody's riding the yellow bus with me, <laughs> is we tend to think, well, I'm not an artist. Eh. So I think I said this a few years ago from up here, but I'm going to say it again. So if you've heard it, sorry. Peace. Um, that's actually not true. Your life, my life, our masterpiece. You've been creating your whole life, whether we were created unconsciously by things that we learn from the society that we live in or our parents, that limitation. We've been, you want to know what your very first artistic endeavor was? Storytelling. And I bet everybody in here is an expert storyteller. <laughs> How many of us are expert storytellers? <laughs> right? We do. We tell stories. We tell it for someone says, oh, how are you doing? Well, I'm kind of tired today. I'm on a tour. I'm looking for a new job. And it just didn't happen. Okay, you just, yes, you are looking for work. I have all these gifts that I want to give, and I'm looking for the perfect place to give my gifts to be compensated and to grow. Now, which story feels better when you tell it? I'm out of work. I can't pay my bills, and maybe I'm too old. Or, God, I have so much life left and I want to go somewhere and give it and I still want to grow and I want some health benefits and I want to be able to pay my do, do you see, which one feels better? We're either co-creating limitation or we're co-creating confidence, power, freedom, abundance, joy, peace. We're always creating. And you don't need your words. So for those of you who say, mm -mm, I'm not telling those stories. As a baby, weren't you fed? Weren't you held? Weren't you changed? That was all without words. And so our thoughts, right, are creating our environment. So we want to be aware of that. And we want to, we want to stretch beyond that. Part of that courting the divine in the morning is we want to increase our understanding of who we are and how life works. It's always expanding through us. So TED Talks, if you haven't discovered TED Talks, they're amazing. If you want to figure out the new good you're trying to do and somebody that's doing it, that's a great resource to go to. If you're feeling down, like, oh, I don't think I can, I don't have enough time, whatever that negative story is, go to TED Talks. There's so much inspiration on there. So I Googled <laughs> lessons in creativity this week. All kinds of stuff came up. Psychology today, yada, 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 right? Number one thing they all said is you have to show up. You have to suit up and you have to show up. So you have to be present to your life and to what it is you want to create. And then you have to show up for it. You have to do something about it every day. You have to be willing to let go of the old and move into the new. So when the Twin Towers crashed, there was this um, photographer, amazing photographer. I don't remember his name. I'm sorry, but I will post it on my Facebook. And I'll ask Shondell if we can post it on the Facebook here. Um, but at least it'll be online. There's this amazing, famous photographer who's known for doing real life, still life pictures. And so he, whatever country he was in, he rushed home and he goes to the um, to where this has happened, where the catastrophes happened. And he's like, he wants to take pictures. And he's stopped by a police officer. And the way he tells it, I think she must have bonked him because he, he felt like he felt like pushed, like physically, and that's how he described it. But anyway, um, the police officer told him. This is a crime scene. We don't take pictures of that. And his mind was like, huh? This is history. A story needs to be told here. Not just the story that we hear on the news. There's something more happening here, right? And so he goes, well, well what if I was suppressed? Where would I be? And she, he says, that she, it's like blocks away. Or they've got them like all cordoned off. And so he's like, 
I don't know what I'm going to do, but I got to do something about this. I need to be taking these pictures. That's what I'm here to do. That's, so that's where he wanted to bring his gift. That was the good thing he wants to offer, right? And so he met some resistance. And he didn't go, oh, I guess, well, God doesn't want me to do that. So I'm just going to go back to wherever it was. He goes, and they don't tell exactly how he did it, but I bet we could Google it, right? He finally gets the authorization to be able to take pictures. And so the beauty of that is one of his contemporaries said to him, I'm so grateful that you're so stubborn. I'm so grateful that you're so tenacious. And he was just like, what? He's like, I'm just passionately optimistic. So basically, if he hits a bump or a speed bump or somebody tells him no, that doesn't mean no for him. That just means, oh, there's another way. I have to find that other way, right? So that's what it is about what it is we want to create. If we want to create more joy, if we want to create you know, a business that thrives, if we want to create a new product, we have to be passionately optimistic. Well, if we begin the day with knowing who we are and that life's on our side, then we know that whatever desire we've had is, or having is already saying yes to us, right? So it is going, <coughs> it's going to support me. It's going to support me in my conversations. He had a conversation with one person, he started asking the questions, and then one thing led to another. And I, I'm sorry that I don't know his name, but Joe I told, pointed out to me that at the first service I did share, but I'll share here. <coughs> he did take pictures. He took amazing pictures. And he said, he said it was so astonishing to him that in the midst of such horror was so much beauty. And that in the midst of such difficulty, there was so much love. Which brings me to my next point that our lives are this perfect place exactly as they are, that those things that we've deemed as hardship or tragedy or that have marred us in some way, those experiences need to be mined because there is some good to create out of those. I know many people who grew up and they may have been molested and then it makes them these awesome coaches and authors and loving presence and one such author said that that abuse of power taught her the importance of being a loving force of power in the world. It taught her that it was her job to love herself, to be the love that she wanted to see in the world. We say, oh, the world is going to H in a handbasket, right? Is that what we want to contribute? Or do we want to contribute more peace and more love and more joy? Or giving these resources to Nepal, we could sit around and say, oh, that's so sad for them. Well, we're certainly not creating better health for them by just saying oh, that's so sad. We have to do action. We have to take an action right where we are. If we say in this philosophy that you, if you're experiencing something that's less than desirable, you can say good must come of this, right? Well, the good doesn't come of it by just saying, okay, good's going to come of it. 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 Not so much, right? I got to pray with somebody. I have to do some affirmations. I gotta move my feet, right? So he says this thing, he goes on to say this in Creative Mind and Success, and I am loving this. And for those of you who are my prayer partners and counselors and coaches in this room, I know this was my cosmic whack on that head. It did not escape me. We all need more backbone and less wishbone. We all need more backbone and less wishbone. There is something which waits only our recognition to spring into being, bringing with it all the power in the universe. Do you hear that? So you decide you're good, you move in the direction of it, and then all the power of the universe rushes in to meet you. Even if you're in a hellacious experience, all the good of the universe rushes in to meet you. But if you stand there just wishing for it to be different, hoping for it to be different, but never make a different choice and then act from a different place, it can't change. We're still inside the box, right? We can't have the new. I remember once a friend of mine wrote this beautiful class called Inside Out. And I don't remember the lesson, but I remember somehow the being in the box was talked about. And I went away and I had this insight that when I box God out, I box me in. When I limit my good, I box me in. We box ourselves in. It doesn't matter where we come from. It doesn't matter what has 
happened to us. It doesn't matter what's going on. What matters is that you leave here remembering and standing firmly in the truth of who you are, a powerful expression of divine presence. Creativity is your nature. And what do you want from here and what are you going to do about it? Are you willing to commit to taking an action step? Because it's not going to change just because we wish it to. We have to actually do something different. We have to think about it differently. We have to talk about it differently. And I don't know about you guys, but the way I do that is I do it with prayer partners, I do it in sangha groups, I do it with practitioners. Not really trying to plug my practitioners, but I am. <laughs> I have three. I don't know about you guys. If you don't have one, you better get one. Because we don't just pray for when life is bad. We pray to grow your dreams, to grow your good. That's the number one thing we do because you're bad. We don't actually see that as bad. We actually see it as good knocking at your door saying, hey, recognize me, live me, express me. Right? Sorry, Willie. <laughs> she said I'll make her fingers want to go, shh. <laughs> But I get myself some partners. Marianne Williamson wrote this book uh, years ago called Building Your Field of Dreams. And it's just what we're talking about. It's about our creativity and building it, right? And she talks about this amazing concept called Partners in Believing. And it's where a group of people get together and you share a goal that you want and you commit to an action step. And then, you know, people might brainstorm and say, oh, well, here's what I do when I'm trying to do that. Research. There's another way for research, right? And then this group knows your truth and then you pray out. And you just meet once a month. Some people call it mastermind, you call it whatever you want to call it. But the importance of you're supporting your new dream. You're supporting your new good. You're supporting, you're saying to the universe, it's like, I'm done thinking like that about this. I'm saying yes to this experience and I'm moving in that direction. And in case you don't believe me, I got all these people that believe me. And when you forget or when, you know, you catch yourself repeating an old pattern or you fall down on it, you can text somebody and say, ooh, what am I creating? I need a reminder. Or email them or call them or whatever. But that person can believe in your good because they don't have your critic. So they don't have any of your nonsense rolling in their head. Thank God, right? The universe loves us so much and give with each other. Because you ain't buying into my BS. Thank God. And I'm not buying into yours. So you have these partners that are standing for your greatness, that are co-signing for your dreams. And for those of you who are saying, Alva, I'm not an extrovert, and I do not want to be telling people my business, um, I'm going to ask you to eh, stretch yourself out of that. If you don't want to do it with a person, you know, somebody, if you don't trust, I, I get sometimes people haven't been safe with our dreams. I'm not telling you to do me and go out and blab it to everybody, because I don't think anybody can rain on my parade. I do a really good job of that myself. <laughs> but I have people that remind me that that's nonsense, right? So... But for those of you who are introverts, that's not your thing. Do it with a practitioner. Get yourself a sangha group. That's safe. It's a safe container. Or join an online group. People that you might never have to see. But that you can say, I'm working on this thing. Join, I don't know, a knitting club if that's your thing that you want to do. At a knitting club, nobody looks over and, girl, that is just messed up with your name. <laughs> People are just knitting and they're connecting in their community. And it's a community and your artistic, your creative expression is having life. It's having room outside of the box. So maybe that's what you do. Uh, I know Robert Sharon Lynn used to have this amazing thing on Fridays where I think it was called an artist circle. I don't remember. I'm, I'm making that creative part of it. But it was something like, what, what was it, Sandra? Creative space. Thank you. It was called creative space. And so you bought whatever your thing was. If you were a writer, you brought your thing to write poems. You bought it to your journal. You bought knitting. You bought crocheting. You bought paint. You know, whatever that was for however long the time was, you gave yourself the space to be creative. So I want you to turn back to that person. I want you to take a second, and I want you to think of one thing that you are willing to commit to on a daily basis to bring this new good into your life. When you have it, turn to your person. <laughs>
go to lunch or have tea? Okay, so I'll tell you two things. One, I had to do that before because we've been told that it takes 21 days to change a habit. I have um, Googled extensively, and lots of things say that it takes six to eight weeks. So I actually, and I'm okay to, to say currently, with some of the things I'm changing, I'm on the slow bus, it's taking longer than six to eight weeks. However, so what I commit to is to do the action until it's as natural to me as brushing my teeth, which is something I do every day. But I don't have to think about it, I don't have to write it on my mirror. So, so sometimes we set ourselves up to fail when we commit to do something new because we try to do it too quickly as if, as if an old pattern is going to change that fast. So if that works for you, if you pick something that you can change in 30 days, groovy. If it doesn't change in 30 days or it's not exactly what you want, I invite you to just commit to that good, good commit to this creation until it demonstrates fully and you have that sense of completion. And so in, in that vein, in keeping with that, so I'll share a personal story about that. So it really occurs to me, I, I used to do this thing where I go into teacher's office once a year and I pick the goal that I want to work on and she helps me pick a spiritual <coughs> practice around it, what my classes are going to be that year around it, so that everything I'm doing focuses on this new good that I want to create, right? So three and a half years ago, I picked Greater Health. I'm still working on greater health. And probably seven or eight months ago, whenever it was I, I wound up in the hospital, it occurred to me that if you don't work on that every single day, for me anyway, because it's not as natural as brushing my teeth, I ain't going to have it. I ain't going to experience it. And I had to really crash and burn to learn this lesson and to also become okay with my process to become patient with my process. Because my goal in the path of health and fitness is like, I want that body in 60 days that took me like 10 years to get to this size. You know what I mean? <laughs> really? Come on. But I was so surprised, you guys, because I was like, I'm a smart person. How in the world did I miss that if I don't take one little action step every single day, if I don't keep this priority before me, I'm never going to actually have that experience. It doesn't matter what the thing is. If we don't commit to that new good every single day, if we just wish for it, want for it, kind of do it sometimes, ditch it whenever we feel like, we're never actually going to have that experience. We might have moments of it, and then it goes away. Have you ever had good and it's inconsistent? Let's say you pray for money, and you get the money, and then six months later, you're like, oh my God, how did I get here? It takes time to change consciousness. It takes patience. It takes committed action and committed focus. And most of us, we don't only want to fix one thing, or it's not, I don't want to say fix, we don't only want one thing to be different, we want a lot of things to be different, right? And so if we pick a lot of things, it's kind of like a hose, like your water's going everywhere, whereas if you pick one thing that you want to demonstrate, one new thing you want to experience, and that, you, your spiritual practices are in service to it, any classes you take are in service to it. Any activities that maybe you do with your friends are in service to it. Or they're not. You know, I also remember that, that friend that about five or six years ago, she started a company. And when she started that company, what I noticed is that her family and her company were her priorities. And she devoted all her time to either her family or her company. And six years later, that company is thriving out the box. And some of our friends are like, oh, that's so wonderful. And we kind of sat on the sidelines like she had something we didn't. But she didn't. She picked a dream. She committed to it. She ate, breathed, and slept it. But there was some balance. She learned to take care of herself. There were some times when maybe she didn't take as good a care as she could, but it was the best she could do in the moment. But I share that with you is when we look at somebody else that's living their dream and we have that, they're not specialer than you. They don't have no, yeah, I said specialer. <laughs> I said it intentionally because we do that, right? Ugh, those practitioners, they're so whatever, or Petra, she's so whatever, or whoever it is. Nonsense. That person is just willing to commit to their dream day in and day out. They're commit to maybe not go to lunch with their friends. Maybe not spend that money on the vacation this year, but invest it in 
their dream, whether it's certification or whatever. Do you see? It's not. No one is more creative than you. You've been creating your whole life. Why don't we start creating more good in our lives instead of less nonsense? And I'm not judging nonsense, because I actually like to pull the popcorn out and watch it. It's kind of entertaining, but that's another talk. <laughs> But as we do that, life everywhere has changed. Life wants for us what we want for itself. When that song said, thy will be done, the will be infinite as we practice it. It's one of freedom. So if there's a place in your life you don't feel free, make a decision to be free. And every choice that you make and every action step that you take is in service to that freedom. That's so I can't do or be anything right here and right now but grateful grateful for the time together and to remember the truth about life that there is one life that that life is perfect that that life is my life that that life is the life of everyone in this room that that life is the life of everyone on the planet that that life is the life of everything on this planet that has ever been that currently is and that is yet to be that that life is creative. And now that creative nature is alive and awake and aware and active, not only in me, but each person in this room. And freedom and joy and abundance and peace and happiness and greater health and loving relationships and meaningful work. And so much more good, infinite good, has been activated here together in our time in the awareness of who we are and sharing it with someone and committing to it. Life says yes. And I firmly declare for each person here that they didn't just come to service today and feel good and then go home and forget about it, but that you are changed, that we do it differently. And then what happens? That the universe rushes in to meet us. And guess what? It takes even less time than we thought it would for this new good to demonstrate so this is one more way we are creating the masterpiece that is our life, a collection of masterpieces. We begin to use every experience that we have in service to the life and the love and the greatness that life is seeking to be in, as, and through us. And how wonderful that is because our world has changed. We can serve in Nepal. We can go to places where there are horror and we can serve with love and kindness. We can know for our loved ones as they go through challenges that right where they are, God and love are present. And I can see that working out for them. We can know that right where we are, no matter what is going on, we don't have to wait another second to be happy. That we can create happiness right where we are by choosing to know who we are and whose we are. And then acting from that place. And we are the peace, we are the love, we are the joy, we are the kindness, we are the compassion, we are the beauty, we are the freedom. We are the good that God is, that we are called to be on planet Earth at this time. So grateful to know this truth. I'm so grateful to be each of your partner in belief. I'm so grateful to know that I'm not your only partner in belief. I'm so grateful to know that whatever this desire is in your heart, life fully supports you. And I'm grateful that as we express our good, it creates more good in the world. Hmm. Life has changed everywhere for the better. So I bless this time and I affirm that we need to let go, let this good come in as and through us. We expect it. We allow it. And if we fall down, so what? We get right back up. Do the committed action that's ours to do to bring this life to you. As Tracy said, breathe it in. And as you exhale, know that it's done. And affirm it with me as already so together by saying, and so it is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.